And I'm sure some of you want to know what happened with my hearing, uh, my disciplinary hearing, which was scheduled for Wednesday, yesterday. A few people have been asking me, you know, what happened. And I've been a bit coy. Um, and that's in part because I'm writing a long post about it. And uh, it's, I guess it's also because I have mixed emotions and mixed analytical reflections on it. And I'm trying to get those out on paper first in a kind of slow and reflective way. And I didn't want to get on the internet too quick and just start spouting because, well, whatever happened, which I'll tell you, uh, whatever happened, you know, it's a significant, this is a significant moment. You know, it's a significant, a really major date in my life, really. And uh, I'm trying to take it all in, you know, I'm trying to just enjoy it, enjoy the intensity of it. I mean, yeah, so I'll tell you what went down, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to hold you in suspense for a little bit. And so by the end of this live stream, I will tell you what happened yesterday, Wednesday, uh, with my career and this whole kind of long controversy that I've been embroiled in, but I'm not going to tell you right now. And if you have any questions about anything else or maybe tangentially related things, I'm happy to take them. But uh, the reason I'm going to dance around the the news is because it's not just to fuck with you, but it's because one of the things that I've really thought a lot about over the past few weeks, which has really struck me, is that through the different communication technologies that we have access to, and in particular the ones that I've been practicing and using now for some time, for more than a few months, almost a year, I've been playing with YouTube and doing a podcast and, and blogging pretty seriously. Over this time, I've realized that different messages I put out into the world will get into different heads and produce different effects and consequences depending on where I put them and how I put them. And that's been really interesting to observe because what it means is people who are communicating in the in public at all, you know, with the public, emitting symbols out into the public, obviously my influence or reach is not at all anywhere near the public as a whole. No one's is today, even the most kind of famous uh, influential speakers or whatever. But in my little slice of the public, or just my effort to throw uh, drops into the bucket, what I've realized is I can have extremely refined control over the, the message and how it actually trickles through my networks and then the extended networks of my networks. And it's fairly predictable. You can do this in fairly predictable ways because the types of people who read or watch different types of media are pretty systematically predictable. And the interpretive tendencies of those different subsets are themselves quite predictable. And who those people are going to tell is pretty predictable. And so it's recently become quite clear to me and it's quite interesting if you think about it it's quite profound i, I mean i it's it it's obviously quite new and i think very few people even really understand the degree to which this can be understood systematically and kind of manipulated systematically i think our understanding uh, is way behind the the actual empirical reality of how of how far and deep this goes so I think this is all very new and, and becoming aware of it in this way is, is very new. But basically, if I'm right, what it means is that, you know, one creative individual can produce quite a, how should I put this, uh, quite a cleverly orchestrated uh, set of different signals. And mind you, none of them are you know, mutually exclusive. Like uh, there's no lying involved in what I'm talking about, but you can just say uh, the same thing in a multiple, in multiple different ways, different times and places and produce, 
you know, you're kind of like painting on social impressions, you know, so like communicating uh, a simple truth of like what happened on one particular day, like what happened yesterday on the day that my hearing, uh, the day of my hearing, what happened yesterday is something that I can tell the world or whatever, but I can do it in this really weird, digitally sophisticated way where I do it exactly how I want to do it. Um, and give slightly different, you know, slightly different inputs, if you will, to the social system at different times and places. And that's not with, with that's not with any lying or anything. It's just about how I place things. So for instance, it occurred to me that if I if I put something at the end, or let's say the middle to end in a random place in the in the live stream, towards the middle or end of a live stream, if I put some piece of information. Only the most diehard, you know, uh, listeners or readers of my stuff are going to get that bit of information. You know, I think this is very interesting and cool. Like, I like the idea that I can kind of drip out information or messaging to my world in this sort of way. Uh, and I think, yeah, you, for all different types of purposes, you know, you might do this in in all different types of ways. But in this case, for instance, with something as momentous as this kind of transitional moment in my life and, and career, you can tell I'm foreshadowing. I'm, I am kind of hinting uh, about what happened, but uh, I'm holding back on the details. <clears throat> with something this momentous, I don't want to just write out some little short press release bullshit and post it on my blog and pen it to my Twitter timeline and just tell the world in some sort of like naive broadcast kind of way what may or may not have happened yesterday at my hearing. And that's because I'm not actually trying to communicate with everybody. I'm only, well, I'm, you know, I, how should I put this? For people who want to create ideas or put ideas out into the world today, there's a variety of multi-level multiplayer games that can be played. And it's complicated and sophisticated and nuanced and, and really fun and, and weird when you think about it this way. There's all different types of things you could try to optimize for depending on what you're trying to optimize for as you know a creative person or whatever, or intellectual or whatever you want to call it. And so yeah, that's just something that I find very delectable and I'm kind of reveling in it because I, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, there's a good number of people out there who are paying attention to my case or whatever you want to call it. And it's not that I want to tease people, but it's more like, I like the idea of reserving for the people that are paying most attention to me, I want to reserve for them, you know, the biggest pieces of information as, as they come to me in my life, you know, something like that. Also, there are just many reasons why you might not want, so for instance, like the people who, um, there's a certain type of person who will only kind of look at headlines, right? Uh, they might scan someone's timeline or they might watch the first few minutes of a YouTube video. You know, they're just kind of looking for easy, low hanging fruit. They want to know real quick, what's, what is this thing? What, what category do I put it in? What pigeonhole do I slide it into? You know, there's a lot of people who basically consume media that way. And that's fine. I'm not judging it. That's a certain type of person is all I'm saying. And sometimes you want, to communicate to those people. You want to get those people what they're looking for quickly for some purpose or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes you don't want those people to be the first one to get your message. Or sometimes you even want to send out a somewhat differentiated set of angles on one particular truth in a way that might actually give different impressions to those different types of people when I say types, I'm talking about, let's say for instance, the type of person who only scans headlines and wants something really quick, has no patience, 
not very intelligent, <clears throat> not really, you know, invested in you versus those people who, you know, like you folks, you know, if you're still, if you've been in this live stream from the beginning and you, you know, that that's commitment, you know, <laughs> sorry, my, my chest is quite congested, by the way. Sorry if it sounds terrible. Pause the mic. There you go. I like thinking about this explicitly. And yeah, so if you are in so invested and kind of a loyal member of my audience, I want to every now and then for certain purposes, I want to give you the news before anyone else. Another way of thinking about it is that what I like about this set of realizations or just kind of objects of theoretical reflection and practical experimentation, what I kind of really like about it, what really draws me to it the most is that it really gives you a way to escape all of the kind of mainstream media tentacles, you know, because in some sense, headline culture and, and mainstream media culture or whatever you want to call it kind of the the buzz of the day once your information or message goes out there it's captured in some sense you know it's it's out of your reach and sometimes as i said you want to do that you want to just put words out there you want to you want it you want to send it out and then lose your baby uh, but sometimes you want to do something a little bit slower and a little bit more careful should i say all right. See, I have this alert now that tells me when I got a super chat in case I don't see it. So we got a super chat here from Brian Knuckles. What's up, Brian? Brian says, hi, Justin. Thanks for sending me Ruling the Void. What are some of the key insights from it that are informing your thought today? Excellent. Brian received the book that I sent out. Uh, Brian is one of the people who signed up for my uh, Get a Free Book <laughs> program. And I sent him Peter Mayer's uh, Ruling the Void. Uh, Peter Mayer is a, sci a social scientist, political scientist, in fact. And uh, I think this book was published with Verso. It's a good book. It's basically about the recent history of contemporary liberal democracies. And it's very data-based. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a quantitative social scientist. So it's basically a kind of quantitative look at democracy, but with a very sort of radical left kind of leaning. And uh, it's quite good. You know, I think Peter Mayer is one of the better left-leaning quantitative social scientists out there. And so, yeah, I, I enjoyed reading that book and I learned a lot from it. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, I can't carry all my books with me, so I have to send them to people. So Brian wants to know what uh, are some of the key insights from it that are informing my thought today? Huh? Well, kind of catching me uh, off guard because I haven't read it. I read it a long time ago. But I can tell you generally that what I like about that book and another book I would put in a category with that book is uh, Wolfgang Streak's Buying Time. Wolfgang Streak is also a, a sophisticated, you know, he's, a, he's basically kind of Marxist, but, but he's, he's empirically sophisticated. So that's what I like. I like, you know, on the left or the right. I like, um, I don't mind, you know, strong ideological leanings or even biases. Uh, I just want it to be sophisticated, you know, and if it's making empirical claims, I want it to be, you know, quantitatively or empirically sophisticated. So yeah, Wolfgang Streak and Peter Mayer are two really good examples of that, I would say. Uh, and so I kind of think of these two books as, as a pair and the, the overall implication of both of these books, when you, when you look at them closely is really just how fucked contemporary liberal democracy is. Um, now they're left, they're lefties. So they tend to see this as a, you know, the narrative that you get from a lot of kind of left-leaning empirical social scientists is that what's wrong with contemporary liberal democracies is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's basically capitalism is seen as kind of the root problem and democracy, which is opposed to capitalism is seen as, uh, kind of the solution and the good thing, which needs to be restored against capitalism, basically. Uh, 
And so there's usually a narrative of, well, there, there are, I would say there are a few um, kind of classic pieces of empirical conventional wisdom, let's say. One is that, you know, post-war liberal democracy did pretty well. The capitalism of, of you know, post-war contemporary liberal democracy did well from about 1945 to 1973. Uh, and then in the early 70s, that's when inequality starts to take off. And that's also when you see certain trends such as across the Western democracies, there's a prioritizing of uh, minimizing inflation, let's say, uh, compared to something like uh, employment, right? So before the early 1970s, if you look at the data, there was relatively low unemployment, but policymakers allowed inflation to vary. From, from 1970 onward, uh, there appears to be a somewhat across the board in terms of across across the Western countries, uh, there's a clamping down on inflation. And the, the interpretation of this is that um, keeping inflation low generally serves capital is, is, is the way that this is interpreted in this literature. So basically from 70 on, there's a kind of increasing protection of capital's interests as reflected in things like holding, you know, prioritizing the the lower rates of inflation. And there's a kind of <clears throat> increasing disregard for the economic interests of working people as represented by, you know, the employment metric. Obviously working people, uh, because they are not creditors, don't care so much about inflation and they care much, they care much more about having jobs, right? So that's, that's a kind of uh, standard trope, if you will, or a standard kind of uh, empirical stylized fact that's emphasized in books such as Wolfgang Streak's Buying Time and also Peter Mayer's uh, Ruling the Void. Um, and so th that there's this kind of um, common conventional contemporary history. Those, those sorts of data trends are, are often kind of the implicit or explicit background. The capitalism used to be kind of good after World War II and then it got kind of taken over by finance by globalization and became increasingly hostile to working people also as reflected in the stagnation of uh, wages from about you know middle of the 1970s it's the early uh, middle it's the early to middle 1970s that it, it seems to be the consensus among kind of uh, critics of this period that this is where things start to really go haywire and I think empirically that that's that's a fair to say I think that is true why exactly is is whole different question but um anyway so <clears throat> to get back to the question a little bit more specifically uh, about the particular book of ruling the void um that was the i mean that the the i would say that the the impression that it left in, in my memory it, i'm not able to cite any particular facts from it but the the particular impression that it left me with is that most of the policymaking or, or politicking of the advanced liberal democracies today is mostly doing nothing. Like the actual substantive goals and interests of policymakers have become whittled away and kind of watered down. In some part, I think, you know, the way I would interpret that is because of the increasing kind of causal domination uh, of, of capital, basically. Things are increasingly determined by capital, and the room to maneuver for politicians is in, is decreasing. And you know, people will make arguments about how that's not actually true, and that's just capitalist propaganda. But as far as I can tell, something like that does um, seem to really be happening, and I, that's kind of what's alluded to in this title of, of Peter Mayer's book, "Ruling the Void." Um, you know, the policymakers of countries such as you know the countries of Western Europe. Um, you know, what are they? What are they really ruling? Well not much they're kind of just hold it's like they're in a holding pattern you know they're more or less trying to kind of uh keep things going in some in some way but there's no real uh agenda there's no real kind of interest in collective there, there's no real like collective energy to do anything there's no there's certainly very increasingly little uh kind of democratic uh collective drive 
to achieve anything, you know, significant, such as like building the welfare state or something like that in England after the war. You know, these kinds of examples of nation states, um, you know, having a kind of shared spirit to do something significant, all of that seems increasingly hollowed out across the, the Western liberal democracies. And, uh, you know, Peter Mayer's phrase in this book, the title of the book is Ruling the Void. It's actually quite similar to Wolfgang Streeck's book, which is called Buying Time. Ruling the void, ruling the void, or buying time—very similar images of you know uh, policymakers in the West today, uh, basically doing doing very little of interest and uh, more or less being crowded out by capital. So I think Peter Maris' book also has some other stuff about how you know the decline in voting patterns and things like that too. General kind of uh, anti-politics. Uh, people are you know. The masses are actually, it's interesting because people often think that uh, now is a time of like intense political conflict where everything is politicized. And in some sense, that's true by some people. Everything is politicized by some people or more of culture is politicized by a certain set of people. But actually, if you look at it from another angle, um, most people are actually less and less interested in politics as we know it uh, compared to, you know, in the West, that is compared to you know, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, you know, people are less interested in the political parties on offer. Even if polarization is increasing, uh, people are less intensely identified with uh, actual belonging in political communities. So like Democrats hate Republicans more now than they did a few years ago, but uh, people have much less positive uh, belonging in you know, their respective political camps or whatever. So uh, yeah, there's tons of data on this sort of thing. And uh, yeah, I actually think that the more quantitatively sophisticated kind of radical left wing social scientists, uh, their books are often really quite worth reading. Uh, so yeah, Ruling the Void by Peter Mayer is one I would recommend and Buying Time by Wolfgang Streak is, is also another. You know, how you interpret the, the data that these folks kind of bring together is very, uh, it's very debatable, right? You can have uh, two totally different uh, narrative frames or even totally different fundamental stories um, attached to the same empirical data. And on some, on some level, it's often undecidable uh, which one is, is true from the data. You know, the data underdetermines the story that you tell about the data. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I think the reason for that is simply because you know, you can you can always construct multiple systems around any particular set of effects, and our processes for actually pinning down that entire system and and, and comparing entire kind of interpretive systems, uh, we're very bad at that. We don't really have have the technologies for that because the larger kind of narrative that you take away from a data set is always going to be influenced by you know aesthetics and you know your uh, previous beliefs and, and all of this. And so you can have a kind of, you can have like Nick Land's interpretation of, you know, the past 40 years that you get in something like the dark enlightenment. If you read Nick Land's the dark enlightenment, or you read Moldbug, you know, uh, democracy is seen as the primary problem of, you know, everything that's gone wrong since let's say, you know, maybe for all of time, but let's say in particular, the past several years, past several decades, let's say, <clears throat> And then you read people like Wolfgang Streak and Peter Mayer, and they tell an equally sophisticated story that's equally engaged with data, but capitalism is the is the root cause, right? And it's the sidelining of democracy that is the problem. Well, you can't really sort out that type of very large, broad debate or, or difference in worldview. It, it, it's hard to sort that out with, with the data. Um, for, for a number of reasons, but uh, that's, I think, where people's kind of fundamental commitments essentially come into play and shape what story they're going to be attracted to and what story they're not going to be attracted to. Ultimately, I would even argue that I think on some level, it kind of boils down to aesthetics. All right, and Cynical asks, Justin, do you, do you read poetry? And if so, who are your favorites? You would like Robinson Jeffers, I think. All right, thank you, In Cynical. I appreciate that. 
I always like uh, tips. If anyone wants to give me suggestions, I, I actually do always look into them, or at least I try. I, I mostly always do. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, as for poetry, I have one poet in particular who, for some reason, and I'm not you know sophisticated enough literarily to tell you exactly why, but there is one poet in particular who is far and away my favorite poet above all other poets. That's in part because I'm not very well versed in poetry. Like I haven't spent a lot of time with a lot of poetry in any kind of depth. So I have a relatively shallow exposure, let's say. But be that as it may, my favorite poet by far is T.S. Eliot. And I'm not sure why. I got into him when I was an undergrad in university. And for whatever reason, it was just the first poetry I ever read that just really connected with me, that I really felt, you know, it was the only poetry I ever read that really made me feel something. And again, that might just be because I don't read enough poetry, but I have tried others and there have been some others that I've liked for sure. But I got really, in, when I started reading T.S. Eliot, I got really into it and got really interested in him. And I read, I read like a couple of his biographies and uh, yeah. So that's a short answer to your question. Uh, my favorite poet is T.S. Eliot. I could try to explain a little bit about why, but I don't think it'd make for a good conversation. I don't pretend to have extremely sophisticated literary tastes. I think I just like, I like his austerity, which is perhaps a little counterintuitive, you know, because he did write a fair amount of free verse and whatever. And he is a kind of modernist, but he was very austere personally. And... I was very fascinated by that. He, he, he was intensely, uh, you know, he had a very intense conscience and he was, he became Anglican, uh, but you know, Anglicanism is quite close to Catholicism. So he had a very kind of severe Christianity that I think resonates with me temperamentally and ethically. And, but, but in terms of the actual literary content, as I said, I'm not, I'm not very well equipped to, to comment. I'm just kind of searching my mind for if there's anything in particular, particular I can remember about why I liked it or what I liked about it. I used to read it to people. I was like, you know, I was like a pretty emo young man, you know, I would like, read T.S. Eliot to dates and, sh and shit like that, trying to impress women. Uh, I don't know if it ever worked, but I remember doing that once or twice. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. That was a good one. It's like so famous. It's kind of cliche, I know, but that is a damn good poem, I think, personally. All right. I think that's enough of an answer for that question. So, uh, all right. Any other questions? And uh, in cynical, thank you for the question. That was a good one. And, and thanks for the five bucks. I appreciate that. And you too, Brian. Appreciate that. So, uh, any other any other questions from the audience? I suppose you're waiting for me to uh, tell you the news. And we are we are 40 minutes in, so I think I could safely I could safely start to tell you the news. Adam Titor wants to know: Do you think that Lacan was a charlatan? because there are evidences, for example, wrong use of mathematical terminology and so on. Mm. I think that Lacan was really smart. I've actually read a, a fair amount of Lacan. Uh, I've published research that uses a fair bit of Lacan. And so I have read a, a lot, not that much, to be honest, I'll, I'll shoot straight with you. I've read, I think like three or four of the books that are based on the seminars. So they're basically like, his his lecture notes published as books. I've read three or four of those. They're fun reading. I I, I really enjoyed reading them. I remember I, th I I have fond memories of them, and I found them quite illuminating and insightful. I thought. <clears throat> In cynical says the Alpine. All right, all right. I think I don't need this audio notification. So In cynical says that the Alpine Christ by Jeffers is great. Well, thank you for a very specific recommendation. And uh, hell, if you're going to pay me two dollars. Damn right, I'm going to look into it for you. Uh, I might even report back on it. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. So uh, where was I? I was talking about, uh, right, Lacan. So yeah, I think Lacan is good. 
uh, really worth reading and fun reading. The, the seminars are fun to read, and I found them useful and illuminating. At least that's my memory. Um, as for his speaking style and writing style and, yeah, the mathematical terminology, charlatan is a difficult word. Obviously, part of this is you have to chalk up to just the culture of, you know, mid to late 20th century French intellectualism. You know, th this is a long-running kind of arms race, if you will, of kind of literary flourish. So he's participating in a kind of competitive intellectual culture. And as many of you know, philosophers in uh, France are, you know, at least once upon a time, I think less so now, but, you know, the philosopher in France is treated quite differently than the philosopher in, you know, the US or even, or the UK also. Uh, you know, the major French philosophers are, are real superstars, at least they were, you know, for quite some time through the 20th century. And so he's coming up in this culture and it's just, a, it's just a very different cultural game. But I think because of that, the, it, it produces all of these weird incentives for in, French intellectuals to write and speak in uh, excessively kind of competitively verbose and kind of excessively inflated ways. And so, yeah, I see that as a kind of systemic sort of game theoretic problem of just the, the cultural context and the, the nature of the meme pool competition at that time. I don't really blame any of the individuals for that, you know? Um, <clears throat> but I think if you can read through that and you can tolerate that, I think there's a real signal in the con, you know? The, the question can be formulated in kind of uh, information theoretic terms, just to very simply as, uh, you know, is there really signal in the noise? Like this is what a lot of people wanna know about radical French 20th century theorists. Like, are they really just bullshitting? Is it just, they produce so many words uh, to sound smart, but there's really nothing under the hood. Um, you know, is there a signal underneath all of the noise is, is the question that people really want to know. And I think with Lacan, there's definitely a signal in the noise, no doubt. Um, you know, whether or not it's worthwhile for you to put in the time and effort that's required to extract the signal from that noise, that is a question only you can answer. And that's going to be different for different people, depending on what your interests or purposes are. Um, as for the clinical value i can speak to that even less i'm i'm not sh too sure about that i think psychoanalysis in general uh it's it's quite debated there's a certain type of contemporary kind of clinical psychologist who uh likes to say that freud was you know like 99% wrong and was actually you know harmful in the long run because of the the incorrect notions that he popularized. And then I've also heard other very smart people say that Freud and therefore Lacan also to some degree, um, even if they got a lot wrong, you know, were way ahead of their time in, uh, you know, identifying and working on real underlying empirical phenomena that just perhaps were very loosely or imperfectly uh, described, one might say. So yeah, I can't really speak to that part of it personally, but I think Lacan was very smart. I think there's definitely a, sig a signal there and a, and a signal that's worth trying to extricate if you have the time and energy to get through it. Um, as for the mathematical terminology, I mean, I think if you understand it correctly, then it's not, it's not so bad. If you, if you, you can't interpret it to mean that there is like some like true really existing kind of mathematical structure to, to the psyche. I would not, I would not take that uh, conclusion from, from a reading of Lacan. I'm not saying I'm not giving you a reading of Lacan. I, you know, what Lacan actually meant, you know, you can have long debates about that. What I'm saying is I'm not, I'm not at all convinced from reading Lacan that uh, the mathematical terminology that he deploys represents some kind of, like truly deeply existing uh, structure. <clears throat> no, but uh, you can definitely argue that some of his um, deployments of mathematics can still be useful. It can still be generative. It can still be, it can still formalize particular intuitions that give you real traction on how to think or how to live. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm quite, even though, you know, I'm, I'm an empirical social scientist and 
uh, quantitatively trained. Uh, you know, I'm 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 quite sympathetic to creative and idiosyncratic deployments of numbers and mathematics. Um, you know, the it's all about how you interpret those sorts of deployments. And yeah, so I would not put too much stock into them empirically, but that doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean they're irresponsible. It, it doesn't. It certainly doesn't mean they're they make you a charlatan. It just means you know you have to you have to take them with a grain of salt and and question uh, question their empirical status. But um, I I mean look I, I'm saying this because I remember quite liking a lot of the diagrams and I remember thinking that uh, they helped me see things. Like for instance, in my paper that I published that uses Lacan, the, it was actually this recent paper I published in the journal Parisia. Um, I actually used some of his, one of his diagrams, uh, his diagram of the drive, of the partial drive. He has this like cool little diagram uh, trying to kind of uh, illustrate how the partial drive works as a circuit. And yeah, you know, I thought it was quite useful, quite illuminating. And I mean, I was, I was able to put it to what I thought was worthwhile kind of explicative use in, in my paper. So um, yeah, I don't I don't see it as a kind of uh, deeply sophisticated mathematical structure, but yeah, so I'm, I'm generally a fan of Lacan, to be honest. <clears throat> All right, I need a sip of water. Where's my water? Shit, lost my water, whatever. What's my stance on cryptocurrency? No stance on cryptocurrency. I think it is what it is. And uh, if Nick Land is right, what I think about cryptocurrency is of very little significance. So yeah, clearly, you know, you can. I'm sure you can guess I'm temperamentally favorably disposed to cryptocurrency. Yeah, no doubt. It obviously represents escape from... Uh, all kinds of traditional control institutions. And I'm very temperamentally inclined to that, of course. And I mean, reading Nick Land's book that he's serially publishing right now definitely makes you really excited about cryptocurrency. It's, it's hard not to be. Nick Land talks about how Bitcoin is a truth machine. And, you know, if you've been following along with my writing and videos and stuff, uh, you'll know that the idea of a kind of techn technologically instantiated enforcement of the truth is something that uh, I find very exciting and attractive. So yeah, the idea of autonomously self-enforcing structures, very attractive. I'm personally very interested, especially in smart contracts and the opportunities that are afforded to kind of creative design of organizations. <clears throat> That's what I'm personally kind of most attracted to because to me, what's really at stake is can you organize or engineer communism uh, in, a, in a really, truly workable, small scale way? And, you know, if the theories, if, if communism is in fact the ethically optimal arrangement of human beings in an organization or community, if that is in fact the case, then it must follow that there exists some engineering diagram in which it is uh, feasible, not just feasible, but you know, in equilibrium, in, in a steady state. And uh, it, I have some hunch, I haven't really thought about this too much or tried to demonstrate it exactly, but I do have a, a hunch that if it exists, uh, cryptocurrency will play some sort of fundamentally innovative role in kind of advancing our ability to engineer that. <clears throat> All right, got a lot of questions now. Looking back, Ryan Peterson asks, are you happy you went into political science or knowing what you know now, would you have chosen another field like economics, philosophy, or something else? It's a good question. Personally, I'm happy with political science. I'm, I'm glad that I went into it. It's an interesting field because it's very influenced by economics and it's also kind of close to philosophy. So, you know, if you're an empirical political scientist, you are kind of closest to political economists and econo econometricians. And if you're a political theorist, then you're adjacent to political, you know, philosophers basically. And so political science is this kind of weird place where it's partially theorists and philosophers and it's partially kind of economists. <clears throat> and I like that. 
I like that. And it's actually a really good field to do quantitative methods in because, you know, there's this saying that, um, show me an economist and I'll give you a failed mathematician. And then there's another saying that says, uh, show me a political scientist and I'll show you a failed economist. So you get that idea. Um, well, if you're interested in math and, and data and, you know, kind of doing quantitatively sophisticated research, but you're not a super high level math genius. That's basically me. In other words, like I'm capable of doing pretty advanced quantitative work and I have done, uh, but I'm not, I'm not smart enough to write articles in like the American economic review or something like that. I'm not smart enough to, uh, write out my own like long formal game theory papers. I, I just don't have the horsepower to do that kind of stuff. So I wouldn't really do well me myself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have succeeded academically uh, as a professional academic economist. I don't have the horsepower, but I do have the horsepower to be a successful quantitative political scientist. So yeah, because you know, how good you have to be at something is, is relative to the field that you're in. So standards are just a little bit different, right? So yeah, for that reason, I think political science was a good fit for me. And I, I could also do theory uh, kind of on the side. Um, so I, I was happy that I went into political science and I, I think as a discipline, it worked well for me. But uh, yeah, it doesn't necessarily generalize. It all depends on what your strengths and weaknesses are, I would say. <clears throat> My thoughts on college majors in general. Uh, you understand that I went to college in America. That's right. Yeah. College majors, my sense is that they don't matter too much. That's just my, you know, in my personal impression, let's say. I have no idea if that's true or not. Uh, but that's that's been my, my read on it. I think if it honestly, like what I my thinking in college was basically like choose a relatively easy major so that I could do what I wanted. <laughs> basically, you know, people who study like organic chemistry or, you know, whatever chemistry or like physics or something like that. Um, you got to really buckle down and really do well in what you're assigned to do. But if you do something like political science, it's not too hard. You know, you can kind of, uh, you can kind of get away with taking different classes or even in your political science classes, you can kind of read other stuff and, and work it in fair with fairly, you know, to a, to a fairly easy uh, degree. So yeah, that's just, again, my two cents. What else do we have? All right, it's 9.54 now. And as I told you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna enforce on myself a, a hard limit on these live streams of one hour. So I will wrap this up in about six minutes. And I think now then is a good time to, <clears throat> now is a good time to uh, give you some news. And I'll be interested to see tomorrow how many people I talk with who heard this news. Because um, basically, if you're if you're in this live stream right now, it means you're you're an OG. It means you're you're deep in the Murphy verse. And you know, for your investment and your loyalty, I want to give you the hottest news, the freshest, juiciest, most scandalous information I possibly can. What's up, Aiden? And. Uh, yeah, but other people, normie people, all those NPCs, all those university administrators who I have on good information do watch my live streams, but you can bet your bottom dollar they don't watch 50 minutes at a time, unless they secretly like me and my content, uh, which is not inconceivable. Those people, I'm not going to give them the privilege of my news quite yet. So in this bunker that I'm now stationed in. I share it with my wife and she just walked in. So now the vibe has just changed and uh, it's okay. Are you trying to be in it or are you trying to not be in it? I'll just say hello. Say hello to the world. Really, you can't see yourself. How, yeah. how do you feel about having to abscond from our home to stay in this bunker together? First of all, it's not a bunker. It's like a huge bedroom in a huge house, but yeah, it feels pretty good. But it's just one room that we're now stuffed in, whereas uh, as of yesterday, we had our own house. Yeah, but he has to remember that what you're forgetting is that the first place that we ever lived was literally an eighth of the size of this bedroom. That's true. So, this is the so really, we're moving on up. It's a good attitude. You see, folks, 
this is the reason why it's good to get married to someone who you started out with in very modest beginnings, I would say. Because when Ari and I first got together, we basically lived My in a- standards are low and I'm easy to please. <laughs> we basically lived in a squat, like hovel. And it was so, it was so disgusting. Our, our, our standards of living, our quality of life was so extremely low when we first started dating that, uh, you know, when we fell in love and got together and, you know, made a commitment to spend the rest of our life together, any possible situation after that would be an improvement. And in, in all seriousness, I, I think that what I'm saying is real. I think we actually did benefit tremendously from that because it gives us a much more relaxed kind of open mind about all different possible scenarios that might, you know, strike us in our life. You know, like if I got this fancy job as an academic and I have a nice middle class salary and this kind of cosmopolitan, international, social status, whatever. If I got all of that and then got married to someone who married me on that kind of basis, assuming I was that type of person and all we ever knew together was middle class comforts. And then I told her one day, honey, I'm going to risk my job because I insist on the freedom to call people retards. <laughs> she would say, yeah, are you fucking crazy? You're you're no, I'm going to divorce your ass is what she would say. Um, but not my wife. My wife is the real deal. We started on the bottom and now we're here. So, uh, when you start on the bottom, everything's, everything's fairly good. And, uh, so as long as we don't fall back to living in an absolute hovel, you know, I think my wife will see me as a successful provider. Uh, anyway, since I'm staying in this bunker, and my wife can come in and it, in and out at any moment since we don't have private space. Uh, something like that might have to happen every now and then. Where was I? I was saying that, uh, <clears throat> right, you all are OGs. We're now 59 minutes deep into this live stream. And, uh, you know, all the normies, all the NPCs out there who are kind of checking my timeline right now, trying to see what the news is. You know, these people, do, they just want to know what happened. They don't want to hang out with me. They don't really care about what I feel, about what I think. They just want the details. And then they want to go run off and talk to their friends about it. Oh my gosh, did you hear that Justin Murphy guy? He got fired. He resigned. He wasn't fired. He got let off the hook. They just want the they just want the details. But I'm not going to make it so easy for them. They'll get it eventually. But uh this is this is this is why I'm unfolding this so slowly. And yeah, so I'll just tell you straight up now. After all of that suspense, I'm just going to tell you that basically I had a hearing scheduled for Wednesday. It was to be at 9 a.m. And I had it on good information that there was like a 99% chance I was going to be fired. And I considered it. I considered it from every possible angle. I thought about it and I made the decision to resign from my job at the university. And I made that decision for many reasons, but I'll briefly tell you a few of them. The first reason is that the, the fundamental fact is just that I have been and am just deeply ready and desirous of not working at the university anymore. Um, and so one of the thought processes was that if on the off chance I did not get fired in this hearing, I would have immediately after told them that I was resigning. And so I, you know, once it became clear to me that I'm definitely done with academia, once I really know, knew that and felt that to be just undeniable and irreversible, then from that moment, it just kind of made sense to resign. All of the reasons why someone might say, oh, you should have got, you should have waited for the hearing. You should have got fired. All the reasons for doing that are, there are some good reasons, no doubt. And I thought long and hard about it. But all of those reasons are, kind of superficial 
and instrumental reasons that they just don't really feel consistent with what I'm actually doing, you know? So like if I were to have gotten fired, then it would have, it would have been this big event, right? There, de there would have been another daily mail article. I probably would have got phone calls from whoever, you know, um, at least like local media, maybe who knows it would have, this would have given it legs to like the Tucker Carlson types or whatever, who knows? You don't really know. But if I were to have been fired, it would have been an event. And I could do that. You know, I've done media. I wouldn't mind doing it. And in fact, I'd have fun with it, no doubt. But uh, that's not what I'm trying to do. Like, I don't, I don't particularly want that. So if I knew that I wanted to resign, even if they didn't fire me, then the only reason I would be kind of waiting around to get fired would be would be for something like the the benefits of it becoming like a media event and i actually have like a fair amount of haters out there who think that everything i'm saying and doing is just for fame and notoriety like this is probably the most common like critique or 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 attack that i get online like people think people think like everything i'm saying and doing is is just like some bid or ploy to launch myself into fame or something like that. First of all, I think that's ridiculous and, and just patently not credible for the simple reason that like, you know, nothing I'm doing uh, would reliably give anyone like fame or money. Like you'd have to be an idiot to, to think that the stuff I'm saying and doing in my project is like going to, with any amount of reliability, get you fame or fortune. It's true. I guess there is like a, you know, just from being like a crazy provocative person or whatever, um, you can, you know, increase your chances of fame from like zero to maybe uh, like 5% or something like that, but <coughs> something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's just patently not credible that uh, everything I'm doing is, is, is for something like that. And so I liked the idea of, since a lot of people seem to think that, uh, I like the idea of quietly resigning just to kind of prove the haters wrong. You know, I mean, I would never make like major life decisions just to prove haters wrong, but that was one consideration, I must say. And Cynical says, nothing wrong with shooting for glory. <laughs> Big peanut. I don't understand the message, but thank you, Cynical, And thank you for giving me $2 with that message. I don't understand, but thank you. So yeah, that was one of the reasons. Um, Another reason was that, well, I, I'll be totally frank that one reason was that if I resign, then I get three more months pay. Whereas if I'm summarily dismissed, I get no more pay. So that de that was definitely one consideration. And that three months of pay is like a good chunk of change. So the one bit of good news here, and this kind of enhances the how academia got pwned story, is I basically milked the university for another three months of paid vacation. So that's cool. Um, what else can I tell you? I can tell you, and I'm not making this up, that the, the night before my hearing, no, a, a couple nights before my hearing, I think two days before my hearing. So the night before, the day before my hearing, I had a dream, I kid you not, that I got fired. And then after I got fired, I, I regretted that I didn't resign. I don't know what that means. I don't know where I came from, but I can tell you as a true fact that I actually really did have that dream and that emotional experience attached to it. And I mean, I don't read too much into dreams, but it was so explicit that, you know, I have to admit, I, I factored that in. I took that into consideration. <coughs> what else can I tell you? Um, what's wrong? Am I too low? Are you finishing soon? <clears throat> yeah, I'm almost done. Uh, I, I was scheduled to close at 10. I'm just kind of finishing up now. Why is this annoying? I'm getting tired. Okay. <laughs> so, right. What were the other reasons? Um, yeah, three months of pay would be dope. Oh, the other thing was that I... My real calculation was I figured that they would fire me anyway, even if I resigned. Like, I actually didn't think it would matter that much. I thought that they were most likely going to fire me no matter what. And so it didn't really matter if I resigned or not. And so one reason that I really wanted to resign is because I wanted to 
contact my the people that matter me that matter to me in my own life. I wanted to contact them and I wanted to be able to tell them honestly and with a straight face, hey, I've thought about it. I've decided that academia is not for me and I've decided to resign from my employment. I did not want to have to email my PhD supervisors and, <clears throat> you know, my family members and stuff like that. I did not want to have to say <clears throat> that I got fired. I don't know. Maybe I'm old fashioned. Maybe I'm proud. Uh, maybe that's silly, but that matters to me. That that actually really does matter to me. I, I like to be able to, yeah, I guess, I don't know. Maybe that's silly, but I don't know. I guess I come from a family where, you know, you don't want to get fired. It's just not something you want. You don't want to be fired. It's just something you're, you're proud to avoid. And you don't want to be the type of person that gets fired. And yeah, maybe I'm, I come from proud people who just really value being able to say they didn't fire me. I quit. So <clears throat> yeah, I really felt that that was a major kind of motivation for me. But as I said, I thought that it wouldn't really matter because I thought I would resign. Then I could email my PhD supervisors and email anyone I wanted. And in the future, tell my family. I chose to quit and I'm done with academia and here's why. And they would say, okay, I understand. Fair enough. <coughs> and, uh, you know, that's honorable. That's an honorable way to go out. Resigning is, is an honorable way to go out and firing being fired is a dishonorable way to go out. And, uh, that was one of the, that was one of the strong reasons that made me want to resign. You know, like a lot of people think about these decisions as if your only audience is like the world stage or something like that. But I, I don't I don't see it that way. And this goes back to what I started off this live stream with, which is that you can actually slice up your communications in, in strategic ways. That's not at all lying. You're you know, you're saying one thing and one thing only, but you're saying it at different times and in, and in, with different words. And you can do it in a way that's kind of strategic, such that a certain type of person gets one message, another type of person gets another message, and so on. So, like, I wanted to act in a way that I could account for myself to my friends and family and the people that I have obligations and uh, that I have obligations to and, um, you know, whose honor my, my behavior and status affects. That was important to me. <clears throat> How this gets filtered into like the international cosmopolitan uh, like media circuits, first of all, that's kind of secondary to me personally. But third of all, because I have these different platforms and I'm not famous at all or anything, but I have just enough kind of people listening and reading that most of what I say will trickle out into, you know, networks far beyond me. I can communicate in a way that's sequenced and kind of strategically conditioned such that um, I tell my people like you all and I tell my family and I tell my PhD supervisors and so on. I tell them straight up what's going on. No questions asked. Um, but I can drop information or choose to not drop information in such a way that all those normie kind of uh, administrator bureaucrat types of people. Um, will either be totally confused and not even know, or they might even get a different impression. So for instance, I was thinking about this today, like maybe I'll never talk about this again, other than this live stream. Think about it. Maybe if I don't write anything about it, if I just hypothetically, if I, let's say I don't write anything about it, I never speak about it again. The only bit of news on this front exists at minute 68 in um, a random live stream on YouTube uh, of February 14th. You all know, all my friends and family know what happened, <clears throat> but all those people who read the Daily Mail article, you know, all those people who heard, oh, that Justin Murphy guy at the University of Southampton, he got into deep shit. I wonder whatever happened to him. Maybe they'll just never know. They'll never hear about it. Um, that's kind of interesting, you know, because the Daily Mail is not going to read like the 58th minute of this live stream. I mean, if they did, that would be fascinating, right? Um, 
but the chances of that are extremely low. So you see what I'm saying? There's this weird kind of um, power, this highly granular kind of high resolution power that you have when you're like someone with just a small audience who's not really famous. You know, it's not like everything I say gets out there. <clears throat> everything I say trickles out eventually, but it's in, it's in, um, it's in this sort of uh, contained way that that's, that's kind of manageable. So I find that interesting. I find that interesting. And so for instance, I'm kind of doing this experiment where I'm going to only tell you now in this live stream at the very end of this live stream, I gave you the basic update. This is the end of, this is the end of, of the story in some sense. In another sense, it's just the beginning of the story. Like it's, this is only the beginning of what I'm really planning and what I'm really doing. Uh, but in terms of this kind of media saga and the public attention that's been on me for like that university of Southampton guy who got into deep shit, that particular media saga <clears throat> is now officially over. I'm no longer an employee at the University of Southampton. I'm no longer an academic officially. And but you're only hearing it. The world is only hearing this in the 68th minute of a random live stream on YouTube uh, from someone who's not famous. You know, some I'm not fucking Joe Rogan. Like the word is not going to be spread immediately. And yeah, so. I'm curious, I'm kind of curious to see, like my wager is based on my experience so far, um, nobody except for like the, my OGs, like the people who uh, kind of pay attention to all the stuff that I do and my friends and family, they're gonna be the only ones who really know how the story ends. And I could, it, I think it, I'm attracted to the idea and quite kind of enchanted by the idea that it could possibly, I could possibly keep it that way, you know? Um, of course, I'll, I'll eventually, you know, tell the whole story. And as you know, I'm writing, I'm writing a book about this. And so, you know, I will eventually tell anyone who asks and, and whatever, but, uh, you could go one step further in what I'm just, in what I'm talking about, because like w w uh, what I'm, what I was also thinking about is like, I could write a blog post for instance, that's a little cheeky and maybe it kind of, the title kind of sounds like I was fired. Right. Uh, but then in the blog post, I kind of explain, I don't lie. I don't say that I, I explain kind of really what happened or something. Uh, but perhaps it's a little bit more sophisticated and it's long and kind of hard, hard to get through. Uh, but I, I, I bet some money that, uh, you know, some random daily mail reporter might just see the headline checking in on my case or whatever. And, you know, maybe they would go and write an article. He's been fired, you know, when in fact, that's not the case. So you can, you can, you can see where I'm going with this kind of perspective that I've become very enchanted by. Um, the way that you can kind of slice and dice your media messaging in a way that has profoundly different effects on different types of people and different long-term consequences. I don't have some kind of like long-term play or anything like that, but uh, I'm just fascinated by this. Uh, I'm fascinated by this. I'm fascinated by the fact that I have different platforms where I can choose to share pieces of information that a lot of people are actually interested in, but I can choose who I share it with, under what conditions, in different styles depending on who I want to know first and how I want them to know it and who I don't want to know yet and how I want them to interpret it. Um, ultimately, you know, it's not because I'm like super sensitive and I'm trying to walk on eggshells or something like that. It's more just, I find it fun. I find it, it's, it's an amazing kind of canvas to paint on nowadays, the digital media environment. So yeah, I'm doing this little experiment where I'm just hiding this little bit of information at the end of tonight's live stream. And uh, I'll be curious by tomorrow, like how many people, actually know what happened or how many people are still asking me what happened. So uh, yeah, that's how the story ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. But as I said, in my view, as I'm holed up in this bunker uh, across town, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is when the story begins. Uh, so my, my throat is very parched. I've exceeded my one hour by 15 minutes. So I'm just going to wrap it up at that.